today the topic for today is congestion control the performance of uh, computer networks depends uh, on a large extent on the kind of congestion that is there in the network uh, so uh, actually this is once again a rather large topic we will um, just touch upon some aspects of them uh, one thing we know by now that in general in network and say say data network or internet in particular although multimedia and other content are coming in but this is a largely it's a lot i mean it's a, first of all it's a packet based network and it's a largely data network where <coughs> it's a, because it's a packet based network and uh, it is announced sort of uh, that uh, that we make only a best effort of delivering a packet okay nothing beyond that now what exactly do we mean by best effort okay uh, so the um, kind of uh, strategies we can take for i mean uh, and, and most of this best effort has to do with how you handle the um, congestion so that is what we are going to talk about today so we know what's congestion when too many packets are pumped into the system congestions occur leading into degradation of performance congestion tends to feed upon itself and uh, backs up uh, and that we will see and congestion shows lack of balance between various network components and moreover it's a global issue because a congestion may happen in some uh, intermediate network because of uh, packets being uh, intermediate router uh, because of packets being uh, pumped from various sources so in that sense it's a global issue <coughs> so we have this intermediate node or uh, this channel or whatever it is and the demand is in the form of uh, various sources pumping in packets at various rates say lambda 1 to lambda n and this is being serviced by the whatever the channel capacity or the router capacity this is being serviced at the rate mu and going to various destinations the problem is demand outstrips available capacity okay so this is the uh, basically the congestion problem an added dimension to this problem comes from the fact that although these lambda mu etc uh, these terms are coming from general queuing theory and for simple <coughs> queuing theory these are the arrival rates and service rates etc but although queues are there but in general the statistics which the data networks follow are rather complicated okay uh, so traditionally uh, telecom networks uh, would follow uh, some Poisson distribution with interarrival time exponential interarrival time but data network it has been seen that it follows something what is called as it has a self similar traffic okay or heavy tail distribution and that's a rather complex distribution but one of its key feature is burstiness that means data tends to come in burst and then there is a comparatively long quiescent period and then again another burst comes so that is a problem which has to be handled and when if several busts arrive at a node at the same time that particular node may get overwhelmed so if information about lambda 1 lambda mu etc known in a central location where control of lambda i and mu can be affected instantaneously with zero time delays then the congestion problem is solved but unfortunately we cannot do that because we have incomplete information and we require a distributed solution okay so and uh, with time varying time delays so this is what makes the problem a little difficult now if you plot the throughput of a network vis-a-vis -vis the load uh, i mean this kind of throughput versus load uh, curves we have seen earlier when we have seen paloha networks and csms cd etc but the network in general this is what happens as load increases uh, throughput also keeps on increasing first at the same rate and then it sort of starts going down and it keeps going down because of uh, the intermediate delays and other uh, bottlenecks come into the picture and then we uh, there is a area where the throughput does not uh, increase any longer and if you increase the load beyond that there is a catastrophic fall in the throughput so this part is known as the knee and this part is known as the cliff and this catastrophic fall is called congestion collapse 
So, ni is the point after which throughput increases very slowly and delay increases fast. We will see delay, we will just have another look at this graph. Cliff, point after which throughput starts to decrease very fast to 0, this is the congestion collapse and delay approaches infinity. Note in an MM1 queue, delay is uh, equal to 1 by 1 minus utilization. So, that is, uh, but uh, as I said that uh, it does not always follow this kind of simple formulation. So, I mean I was talking about the delay, if you, uh, if you note this that if this was the previous curve and as you plot the delay, first the delay is low, then the delay starts increasing. Then in this area where there are lots of packet losses and there is congestion collapse and throughput collapses, the delay also becomes very, very high, tends towards it becomes hyperbolic. All right. So, obviously, you have to uh, I mean take all uh, precautions not to fall into this area at all. So, <coughs> we talk about congestion control whose goal is to stay left of cliff, that means do not go into the congestion collapse. Congestion avoidance, goal is to stay left of the knee and right of the cliff of course, is your congestion collapse region. So, goal of congestion control is to guarantee stable operation of packet networks and a sub goal is to avoid congestion collapse. To keep networks working in an efficient manner that is uh, another one you might put it that way. For example, high throughput, low loss, low delay, high utilization. Okay. Uh, well, these are the goals not uh, always achievable, uh, <coughs> especially because we have a distributed system with insufficient information about the uh, global picture, but anyway that is there. Uh, Now, to provide fair allocation of network bandwidth among competing flows in steady state. So, there has to be some kind of fairness if it is there, if all are equal, sometimes all are not taken as equal, we will see that. Here let me just mention this point I was making earlier about uh, the congestion. First of all, you must see that if there is, a, there is a congestion at an intermediate node, what would happen is there will be a lot of packet loss over there. Now, these were uh, uh, the uh, so packets, various packets from various sources would be lost and the delay would become high. So, maybe many of them were uh, sort of running a TCP protocol. So, who would again start uh, retransmitting and again so uh, what would happen is that as more and more packets are lost, more and more packets keep on getting pumped and the delay sort of just like a traffic jam, it starts at one place and then if the jam does not uh, um, hmm, sort of uh, <laughs> resolve itself uh, early, then it starts uh, getting bigger and bigger and it gets starts getting pushed uh, towards the source. So, of course, the, so then your, uh, so your um, uh, overall network throughput goes down even further. Uh, so, people start pushing in even more packets, so such things may happen. So, these are the kinds of scenarios that we would like to avoid. Now, there are various po uh, policies at various levels that we can take for uh, congestion control. So, let us look at the data link layer uh, as open loop policies. So, one is retransmission policy, how would you retransmit? One example of this retransmission policy let us say uh, is that suppose you have an ethernet uh, network with a CSMA CD going on and then you have detected a collision. The question is how do you, I mean do you, are you becoming persistent or non-persistent, you do a random backup, uh, back off or exponential back off uh, or, or, or what is your retransmission policy when you will try again. So, what is your retransmission policy that is important. Similarly, other things like out of order policy, if uh, <coughs> packets receive uh, are received at out of order, acknowledgement policy, do you acknowledgement or, or you do not acknowledge. For example, if you have acknowledgement, acknowledgement also, acknowledgement for each packet also takes up network resources. Okay. So, if you acknowledge every packet, then there is going to be as many packets sent as many um, acknowledgements. Okay. So, that is a lot of acknowledgement for the network, so that is a high overhead. Uh, so, maybe you would uh, you take a policy of not acknowledging all the packets, could be. Some kind of flow control policy. 
So, uh, we have seen some kind of flow control in TCP, so we will look into more details and variations of it uh, today. And then in the network layer, you can have virtual circuit versus uh, datagram. Okay. Uh, uh, this is an uh, important issue uh, and we will <coughs> look at it in more detail when we discuss QoS and multimedia uh, communication. Uh, the, but the point is just uh, at this point I can just say very simply, uh, suppose uh, there is a uh, communication very important communication going on between two hosts and it is a very important or mission critical or whatever for them. Uh, now, in this case, so they will be exchanging a lot of packets, let us say their packet is flowing in only one direction, so a lot of packets will be sent uh, and we want some premium service for uh, this. Now, if you want to give a, a premium service to this particular uh, uh, pair of nodes, maybe they pay more or something like that. In that case, you have somehow to uh, distinguish that all the packets, you have to classify them that okay, they form some kind of a flow. So, you have to have some kind of a virtual circuit between uh, these two points in order to distinguish them. If all packets are on their own, uh, then that is a uh, different kind of uh, situation where it may be more difficult to distinguish the flows between uh, two specific uh, nodes. Okay. So, virtual circuit versus datagram may be an important issue. Once again, we will see more details of this when we uh, look at RSVP uh, and diff serve and things like that in the, um, in the QoS when we discuss QoS in a little bit more detail. Packet queuing and service policy. That means, uh, the, so that is again important, that means in the router a number of packets are coming in, so they are going to be serviced one by one. So, they are going to be put in a queue maybe. Now, the question is uh, do you put them in one queue, do you put them in several queues? If you have several queues, do you have the same priority for all the queues or do you have different priorities for different queues and so on. Packet discard policy, so this is has to do with the buffer management of the router. If the <coughs> buffer becomes full, which packet do you drop? Uh, then routing algorithm, or what kind of routing algorithm you use, packet lifetime management that means when do you say that okay, this packet is lifetime is over you drop it or something packet lifetime management. So, these are the important uh, these things at the network layer. Then so we were talking about open loop policies, S now you can have closed loop control that means monitor the system to detect when and where congestion is occurring pass the information to places where action can be taken, adjust system operation to correct the problem. Uh, the, so, so, actually this is more sophisticated and uh, actually in some sense it is better. The point is say uh, one router in between has becoming congested. Now, if it can um, sort of uh, identify the sources which are the chief uh, sources of trouble so to say in the sense that it is pumping a lot, a lot of packets which cannot be handled here. If you could send a feedback back to the source, uh, so that he can control his um, behavior somewhat maybe send less number of packets, then the situation can be handled. Or you can um, uh, say adjust some system parameters like maybe window size in a TCP or uh, <coughs> so these are examples of the kind of thing you can do with closed loop control. So, if you say that uh, there is some congestion, we have to have some way of measuring congestion or you have to have some metrics for measuring congestion. Okay. So, um, one is a percentage, I mean there are, these are some examples of things that you can look at, percentage of all packets discarded due to lack of buffer space, all right. so that is maybe one, um, one measure, average queue length in the buffer, number of packets that time out and are retransmitted average and standard deviation of packet delay. So, these may be metrics with which you measure congestion. So, if these metrics go uh, um, uh, beyond a certain level, then you might uh, decide that okay, uh, as some congestion is, is taking place and we need, need to take some action in order to prevent the um, performance uh, degradation uh, in a sharp manner. Feedback mechanism can be various as we have mentioned, router on sending congestion on sensing congestion sends a control packet to the source we have mentioned. 
a bit in every packet can be reserved to announce congestion. So, this bit so say somebody uh, <coughs> um, uh, gets a uh, uh, this uh, uh, so what it will do is that one this bit will be set to announce congestion or you can send somebody can send explicit probe packets uh, to ask about congestion. Implicit algorithms of course, make only local observation. So, that is always there. Then what you can try to do is that you can try to adjust system operations, adjust time constants to a near optimal value, decrease the load selectively if possible. Uh, the selectively uh, uh, because I mean, I mean maybe if uh, one source somehow can be decreased maybe all the others can be uh, served very well could be because it goes below a threshold. Increase resources if possible if that is possible I mean that uh, this of course, is uh, usually difficult. Now, let us look at one aspect of congestion control which is uh, very important which is uh, done all the time by TCP, TCP congestion control. TCP if you remember uses the sliding window protocol. Um, so, we have a window uh, and a sender can send right up to the window size to the other side and it will wait for acknowledgements and he will keep on acknowledging and as that he gets acknowledgement the window will slide. Okay. So, that is one kind of uh, that, that, that is the basic TCP. What we are going to see now are some variants of TCP since TCP is a very important protocol and uh, application protocols like FTP, HTTP, etcetera they use TCP. So, a lot of traffic lot of important traffic on the net is actually carried on TCP. So, that is why congestion control the whatever we can do at the TCP level that is important and uh, um, one of the chief uh, tool for uh, doing any congestion control by TCP is by uh, adjusting the window size. So, there are various variants and we are just going to look at some of those. TCP has a mechanism for congestion control, the mechanism is implemented at the sender. The sender has two parameters, congestion window uh, which is called uh, this is a variable called CWND and slow start threshold value SS thresh. So, initial value is the advertised window size. So, when a TCP connection there is an uh, advertisement of window size and this window size is taken as the initial SS thresh value. So, congestion control works in two modes one is slow start and in the slow start phase uh, is the phase is slow start when the CWND value is less than SS thresh and congestion avoidance where that means, when the CWND value is greater than equal to SS thresh. So, basically we are uh, uh, sort of trying to figure out whether we are on the left of the knee or on the right of the knee. So, if you are on the right of the knee, but left of the cliff we are going to be careful if you are on the left of the knee then we can sort of if and things are going fine then we can uh, sort of try to increase the load so as to increase the overall throughput. So, that is the basic idea. Now, initial values this is a slow start that means set CWND is equal to 1. So, uh, naturally if the um, window size is small say 1, so 1 unit will go and then an acknowledgement will come back and then only something else will. Uh, go from this side. So, that is so we are being very conservative you are sending only a small bit of information. Now, note the unit is a segment size one of what one of a segment. So, TCP actually is based on bytes and increments by one MSS maximum segment size. The receiver sends an acknowledgement ACK for each packet. So, this is the slow start. So, receiver must acknowledge every packet. So, that the first packet that is that it receives it can send the acknowledgement. No, generally a TCP receiver sends an acknowledgement for every other segment we will come to that uh, later, later. So, each time an ACK is received by the sender the congestion window is increased by one segment. So, what happens is that the sender has sent one packet it has got the um, acknowledgement. So, actually the sender then decides that okay, things are fine. So, maybe we can do better that means increase the uh, uh, congestion window size CWND. So, we increase CWND by 1. So, make CWND equal to 2. 
So, if an ACK acknowledges two segments C w and d still increased by only one that means for every ACK that is increases by one. So, if that acknowledgement uh, in uh, increments only uh, I mean acknowledges only one segment or two segments C w and d is increased by one only. Actually, the uh, reason to acknowledge every other segment is to decrease the number of acknowledgements. Now, even if ACK acknowledges a segment that is smaller than MSS bytes long, C W N D is still increased by 1. So, the point is that any time you get an ACK, you increase C W N D by 1 when you are in the slow start phase. Now, but uh, although it starts slowly, does it increment slowly? Not really. In fact, the increase of C W N D is exponential. So, the congestion window grows very rapidly, C W N D rises very rapidly. For every ACK, we increase C W N D by 1 irrespective of the number of segments ACK. The TCP slows down the increase of C W N D when C W N D is greater than S S thresh. So, uh, actually as you can see, suppose it sends one segment, receives one acknowledgement, C W N D is increased from 1 to 2. Now, it can send two segments, segment 2 and segment 3. It will get back acknowledgements for segment 2, acknowledgement for segment 3. Now, C W N D has become 4. So, it will uh, <coughs> it will send 4, 5, 6, etcetera. So, um, so, so 3 of them it has sent and the uh, acknowledgement for 4, 5, 6 will come. Now, C W N D has become 7 and it will send more. So, you see 1, 2, 4, 7 is increasing quite fast, but because for each acknowledgement it is increased by 1 and uh, when you are sending so many segments at a group, you are getting so many acknowledgements. So, it is CW and is increasing exponentially. Congestion avoidance phase is started if CW and D has reached that SS thresh, uh, then each time an ACK is received, increment CW and D as follows that means CW and D is equal to CW and D plus 1 by floor of CW and D that is the uh, uh, minimum uh, or rather the largest integer which is smaller than C W N D. So, this is now increases only by a fraction and while sending of course, you can uh, you will not send a fraction whatever be the current C W N D value its floor that many segments you can send. So, C W N D is increased by 1 only if all C W N D segments have been acknowledged that means, if uh, all the C W N D all have been sent or acknowledged then C W N D increases only by 1. So, we are very cautious while moving to the right of the mean. So, assume that S S thresh is 8. So, what will happen is the round trip time is uh, round trip times this is t equal to 2, 4, 6 etcetera as time is going. So, C W N D is first increasing exponentially, then it reaches the S S thresh, then it increases only slowly. Okay that is the point. So, TCP assumes there is congestion if it detects a packet loss. Now, what happens if the response what is the response to congestion? TCP assumes there is a congestion if it detects a packet loss. A TCP sender can detect lost packets via timeout of a retransmission timer or receipt of a duplicate ACK. Uh, <coughs> duplicate ACK has been received which means that uh, maybe uh, um, uh, some acknowledge some previous acknowledgement might have got dropped. So, that is why duplicate. So, anyway something was got dropped. So, it senses that maybe there is some uh, congestion. Now, there are different ways to uh, sort of um, respond to this congestion. One is the TCP interprets a timeout as a binary congestion signal which means that there is congestion as soon as there is a uh, timeout. So, the sender performs. So, C W N D is now reset to 1. So, it becomes once again becomes very conservative research to 1. S S thresh is set to half the current size of the congestion window. So, whatever I mean before sending it to 1 whatever be the C W N D value you divide that by 2 and make that the uh, new uh, threshold and slow start is entered. So, you enter slow start again. So, initially S S uh, C W N D equal to 1 s s thresh equal to advertised window size. New acknowledgement received if c w n d is less than s s thresh c w n d is equal to c w n d plus 1 else congestion avoidance c w n d is equal to 1 by c w n d plus 1 by c w n d with the ceiling of this. If there is a timeout 
multiplicative decrease which is S S thresh is equal to C W N D by 2 and C W N D becomes equal to 1. So, this is the typical plot uh, of C W N D for a TCP connection with TCP Taho. TCP Taho is one flavor of TCP that we have been discussing, we will discuss some other flavors also. So, C W N D goes on increasing, decreasing, it is increasing, then it keeps on increasing when things are good, etcetera. Uh, so, this may be a typical plot. So, this was TCP Taho as I said uh, is uh, one flavor, it uses a slow start that is 1 plus and for every acknowledgement congestion avoidance that means make only see the after beyond SS thresh increase slowly fast retransmit I will tell you what fast retransmit is. TCP Reno also um, there is another uh, version of TCP um, um, uses fast recovery and then there are some versions of this like new Reno and SAC etcetera. So, receiver sends uh, um, uh, and now acknowledgements in TCP, receiver sends acknowledgement to sender, acknowledgement is used for flow control, error control and congestion control. Uh, error control of course, if the acknowledgement is not received, they send retransmit, so that is the error control and congestion control as we are finding that ACK is used for uh, controlling this. ACK number sent is the next sequence number expected. Delayed ACK, TCP receiver normally delays transmission of an ACK for about 200 milliseconds. Uh, so, um, when uh, things are alright, so because it uh, allows the uh, packets to arrive uh, before, uh, so that it can maybe it can send less number of acknowledgements this way. And ACKs are not delayed when packets are received out of sequence. So, uh, when, so when some packet is received out of sequence and something is uh, a little out of the ordinary, maybe that came through two different paths. So, you uh, do not delay the ACK, you send it immediately. Now, if fast retransmit, if you remember that TCP uh, <coughs> Reno uses fast retransmit, if three or more duplicate ACKs are received in a row, the TCP sender believes that a segment has been lost. So, then that means, uh, I mean ACKs have come, that means some earlier uh, packet has uh, uh, gone. Uh, so many times maybe, but then <coughs> that means most possibly the later um, um, the later packets or later segments may have uh, it is quite likely that they have become lost they have got lost. So, what it does is that without waiting for the uh, timeout to occur for this particular segment which has been sent it assumes that maybe it is lost and send one again. So, then TCP performs a retransmission of what seems to be the missing segment without waiting for a timeout to happen and then it enters slow start, slow start that is it brings down a multiplicative decrease of SS thresh and sets C W N D to 1. So, this is fast retransmit and fast recovery it avoids slow start after a fast retransmit. That means, after a fast retransmit, intuition is duplicate X indicates that data is still getting through, at least the duplicate X got through. So, after three duplicate X set retransmit, retransmit lost packet, okay, that is fine. SS thresh you decrease to half, but CWND is equal to CWND plus 3 and then you enter congestion avoidance. So, increment uh, on um, <coughs> CWND by 1 for each additional duplicate ACK. So, this is a fast recovery, but then after this you enter the congestion avoidance that means, if you um, that means basically this is trying to tune the uh, performance of TCP to get the maximum throughput without uh, causing trans uh, congestion. When ACK arrives that acknowledges new data C W N D is equal to S S thresh. So, enter and after that enter congestion avoidance. So, this is fast recovery. So, TCP Reno uh, for duplicate acts it does fast retransmit and fast recovery, fast recovery avoids slow start and if there is a timeout, you retransmit and go to slow start. TCP Reno improves upon TCP Tahoe when a single packet is dropped in a round trip time, but if multiple packets are dropped then of course, TCP Reno uh, is not uh, does not cannot handle that. For that we have a TCP new Reno. When multiple packets are dropped, Reno has problems. 
So, partial act occurs when multiple packets are lost. A partial act acknowledges some, but not all packets that are outstanding at the start of a fast recovery, takes sender out of fast recovery. So, sender has to wait until a timeout occurs. So, in new reno, partial act does not take sender out of fast recovery. Partial act causes retransmission of the segment following the acknowledged segment. New reno can deal with multiple loss segments without going to slow start. And then there is a selective acknowledgement. Here you can uh, selectively acknowledge in you know in the in the standard or original TCP uh, when you give an acknowledgement. So that is the next segment you are expecting. So all others before that, all segments before that are acknowledged. So here you can give selective acknowledgement that maybe I have got this, 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 and I haven't got that. So issue Reno and New Reno retransmit at most one lost packet per round trip time. Selective acknowledgement, the receiver can acknowledge non-continuous blocks of data. That means SAC, selective acknowledgement of 0 to 1023, 1024 to 2047 uh, and so on. Multiple blocks can be sent uh, in a single segment and in TCP SAC, it enters fast recovery upon three duplicate acts. Sender keeps track of SACs and infers if segments are lost. Sender re retransmits the next segment from the list of segments that are deemed to be lost, like fast retransmit. Anyway, so there are so so people have tried various kind of uh, what I should call heuristics to improve the performance of uh, TCP. So there are two uh, competing demands here. One is that we want to maximize the throughput. And uh, uh, so, if you can maximize the throughput naturally, the overall delay congestion everything will be small and at the same time you will get your job done faster. But in order to push this uh, maximum throughput, we should not get into a congestion or I mean absolutely no, no is a congestion collapse. So, we try to uh, guard against that. So, these are the various versions or various flavors of TCP for doing that. So, we will look at, uh, so we have looked at TCP, now we are going to look at some other um, topics um, once again associated with traffic engineering, uh, this uh, congestion control and one is traffic engineering. That means, can you shape or can you sort of um, handle your traffic in a particular way, so that congestion is less likely to occur. Now, there are various components of the quality and this is uh, the all these builds to give a quality of service in a, uh, in a network and at routers these may depend on packet classification and packet scheduling. At network entrance it may have to do with traffic conditioning, at routers or somewhere in the network you may do admission control, between host and routers you may do signaling. So, these are the different components of QoS of a network. So, let us say you have a sender here and a receiver here, these are the intermediate routers. You can do traffic conditioning at the edge of the network. You can also do admission control here or somewhere else. So, these are the different components. Now, traffic conditioning mechanisms at the network boundary need to enforce that traffic from a flow does not exceed specification. Okay. So, we will look later at what kind of specifications we are talking about, what kinds of things that people may sort of uh, agree on or negotiate about that what are the parameters. But suppose uh, from some source we had negotiated certain parameters and we find that uh, that source is not uh, sticking to that uh, parameter. So, it is rather going way out of that, then you have to do some policing. So, policing is drop traffic that violates the specification the specification as was agreed between the service provider and the uh, sender. Shaping that means buffer traffic that violates specification and uh, marking, mark packets with a lower priority or as best effort if the traffic specification is violated. Let us look at traffic shaping first. Regulating the average rate of data transmission allows control algorithms to work better. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, very, um, I mean this is to be understood as I mentioned earlier that um, this computer networks specifically data networks 
our internet traffic etcetera they are inherently very bursty in nature all right very bursty in nature. So, when it comes data comes it comes in one big bunch and then for long periods uh, there is uh, uh, there is maybe no traffic. Now, the trouble is if you are uh, if now the um, the average say the burst peak to the average ratio may be as much as 1 is to 1000. Uh, so, that naturally brings up a very important issue that are you going to design your buffer and other the network provisioning would you do it for the peak or would you do it for the average or maybe you do something for in between. Actually doing it for the I mean designing it for the peak I mean if you had designed it for the peak of course, everything would work fine, but then that is becomes very expensive and not uh, very practical in many cases. Uh, so, uh, what is done is so uh, I mean of course, you cannot do it for the average also that may be too low, but may, so maybe you are somewhere in between. So, one inherent problem is the burstiness of the traffic. Now, if you could somehow make the burstiness uh, I mean smooth it out a little bit more, then all your uh, system would work much better. So, one way of doing that of course, you have to buffer it somewhere all right. So, this is what we are going to talk about. The shape of the traffic relates to some statistics about data transfer rates as well as its sensitivity to error, delay, jitter etcetera. One famous algorithm known as the leaky bucket algorithm, uh, uh, it is a single server queue with a constant service rate. You know if you have a bucket which is leaking, so drop, 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 drip, drip, drip it will uh, uh, I mean the maybe the water will come out at a constant rate and <coughs> so the same thing that if you, you have a queue, a single queue and then you service it at a constant rate that is the rate at which you are pumping data into the network. So, instead of the burst, so if there is a burst that will get absorbed in your buffer at the edge. So, that uh, towards the core of the network in the core of the network the burst will not come. So, it will be a more uh, sort of steady uh, kind of flow. If a steady average kind of flow is also something beyond the capacity of the intermediate uh, nodes then of course, the uh, capacity of the intermediate nodes are to be increased anyway. So, that is the leaky bucket algorithm in short. So, the input buffer allows a bursty flow to be smoothed out to an even flow into the onto the network. It may be implemented in uh, hardware or uh, the OS operating system. So, it may be implemented either in hardware or software. Underutilized slots are uh, written off. Uh, by this what we mean is that so, uh, say uh, so the packets are being serviced from this network at a uh, particular rate let us say once every t unit of time. Now, after another t unit of time it will again try to service and if it is fine that the buffer is empty then nothing uh, so it will not um, send anything. Again after t units of time it will send exactly one uh, if something has arrived by that time it will send uh, one packet. So, that is the underutilized uh, slots are written off. The algorithm can work on the volume of traffic rather than the number of packets also. Only problem, so this is fine except that uh, it is somewhat slow response time for inherently bursty traffic which is quite often the norm. So, uh, one way to uh, handle a little bit of burstiness is by a token bucket. So, this again improves the throughput a little bit and it can uh, accommodate uh, burstiness to a certain uh, degree. Of course, we cannot uh, allow all kinds of burstiness because then that will get the burstiness will uh, flow into the core of the network where it will be more difficult to handle. So, uh, the this is a token bucket it limits the input to specified burst size and averaged it. Uh, so, traffic sent over any time t capital T is less than equal to r star t uh, that means, the average rate multiplied by the t plus some burst size also known as linear bounded arrival process. So, there is a bound on the arrival process excess traffic may be queued marked or simply dropped. So, for this what we do is that tokens are generated for the buffer at a fixed rate which can be accumulated. So, this is the uh, main point where this token bucket differs from the leaky bucket in the leaky bucket the underutilized slots were written off, but here if your time comes you can gather a you can sort of get a token and you can collect or accumulate up to so many tokens 
and then when a bust comes then up to that many tokens you can send all right so the uh, longer time average is uh, sort of held because uh, there is a limit to the number of uh, <coughs> Mm, tokens you can uh, really accumulate after that you cannot accumulate tokens anymore. At the same time some burstiness some a little bit of burstiness is allowed because if your uh, source is inherently bursty. Uh, so, if you can uh, allow some amount of burstiness that will improve the throughput. So, for each token only one packet can be sent, but tokens can be accumulated up to a certain maximum. A variant is to allow k bytes per token. Essentially, it allows bursts up to a re regulated maximum length that is maximum number of tokens. A leaky bucket may follow a token bucket also in order to make it absolutely smooth. So, this is uh, just a diagram there are bucket holds up to b tokens and then on there are so many tokens per second are accumulating there and when a packet burst comes. So, it waits for the token if the tokens are not there then it cannot send. But if the tokens are there depending on how as many tokens are there so many those many tokens are removed and so many packets are sent into the network. Now, uh, having uh, talked about this let us just mention what are the kinds of uh, traffic parameters that may be negotiated or, uh, or that are important or that may be negotiated between the sender and the uh, network service provider one could be maximum packet size how big is the packet token bucket rate so what is the average rate token bucket size that means how bursty it will be maximum transmission rate so what is the maximum transmission rate loss sensitivity is this flow very sensitive to losses like if it, if you are just uh, doing some file transfer it will be sensitive to losses if you are uh, doing some maybe um, uh, sending some voice it may it may not be that sensitive loss interval at what intervals if the loss can be very bursty or if the loss has to be averaged out or what burst loss sensitivity packets in terms of number of packets minimum delay noticed and maximum delay uh, variation which are allowed. So, these are again very important for multimedia traffic quality of the guarantee is it uh, just best effort or better than best effort that kind of thing. So, these are uh, the uh, flow specification of services. Now, just the <coughs> quickly let us go through the other topics one is in admission control we will come uh, to admission control and signaling uh, in more detail when we discuss RSVP uh, in the next lecture when we discuss Q, QoS and multimedia traffic, but just to mention it here admission control is a function that decides if the network has enough resources admit new flow if enough resources are available reject the flow otherwise. So, what you do is that you do some reservation of capacity through some uh, protocol like RSVP which we will discuss later and if you find that you can reserve the capacity for this kind of flow for this uh, flow having this kind of parameters then you admit it otherwise do not admit it. Of course, this uh, um, sort of uh, assumes that we are having some kind of a virtual circuit and there may be distributed admission control instead of a central admission control at the beginning. So, example is may be end to end delay must be less than a delay bound D. So, calculate D 1, D 2, etcetera and uh, what you do is that um, from the source uh, if the if D uh, the capital D is of course, specified by the source and as it travels uh, some reservation signal then uh, uh, it sort of calculates the delay d d 1 d 2 d 3 etcetera and if d is less than uh, d 1 plus d 2 plus d 3 then you reject it because you are un unable to handle it if it is uh, greater then you accept it. Some signaling protocol is, is used to reserve and release resources and to do admission control as I mentioned this RSVP etcetera diff serve we will uh, discuss in more detail in the next lecture. So, uh, so a reservation may be reserved 1 Mbps. So, you reserve 1 Mbps that request goes through. So, this is the congestion control in virtual circuit one approach is admission control not allow new VC till congestion goes away or route new ones around problem areas. 
or there is negotiate flow specification when new VCs are set up. This res requires resources like buffer space, bandwidth, etcetera, reservation along the way. This of course, uh, I have to do a lot of um, negotiation, etcetera. This takes again some overhead. One topic which we mentioned earlier, you remember the TCP IP source quench okay, or sometimes something called a choke packet. So, this may be used uh, as a crude mechanism for handling congestion. Each router monitors each output line and calculates the utilization as a weighted sum of current and past utilization. Above a certain threshold, a choke packet with the destination is sent to the source and the original packet is tagged and sent along. On receiving a source choke packet, the source is supposed to reduce the traffic to the destination by some percentage. So, if that happens and if it works out, then that is very fine. <coughs> I mean this is the problem you see that uh, a point where the um, problem or congestion is detected and the source they are sort of distributed I mean they are sort of remote to each other. So, whenever you this thing somehow you, I mean if you could send this feedback instantaneously then you could do of course, uh, control the congestion much better, but that is not possible we have to have a distributed algorithm where you work only with some local information and something that might come along with some particular packet. The source waits for some time before acting again on the next choke packet because there may be multiple choke packets coming uh, that means for the same burst that it has sent what happens is that it has created uh, ripples of uh, um, congestion along the way and all the routers are sending a choke packet. So, it is going to I mean so multiple choke packets does not necessarily mean that these are independent they may have come from the same source for uh, because of the same source. So, it waits for some time before acting on the next choke packet. For high speed lines with a lot of hops, choke packets to the source is too slow. Okay. So, choke packets may operate hop by hop thus uh, distributing the pressure on buffers. So, that is again another point this choke packets of course, add to the network um, traffic and it operates hop by hop thus distributing the uh, pressure on uh, buffers. Now, we talk a uh, little bit about uh, uh, scheduling. This is another way to try to handle um, congestion. Packet scheduling this has to this, uh, do with deciding when and what packet to send on output link usually uh, implemented at the output interface. So, suppose you have some switch or router some network node. Uh, now, uh, so which is sort of uh, and, and a number of packets are coming out. So, what you might do what you might want to do is to classify these packets. Uh, uh, so, uh, when we actually uh, the point is when we say the best effort um, actually in this context actually this is the worst effort all right. So, there are premium service and other kinds of service etcetera etcetera and the rest are the best effort for with the rest. So, what you have what you have may have is that you may have various classifications for these flows. So, which may go into different queues and then there is a scheduler which schedules that which queue to service next and how. So, that is the scheduler. So, this has <coughs> a vital role to play on the kind of services. Uh, and uh, that each of sorry each of the packets uh, at the micro level and each of the flows in general at a higher level and uh, they get. Now, typically internet queuing in internet queuing what we do is that we use uh, FIFO plus drop tail. Uh, what is FIFO? FIFO is first in first out of course. It is a simplest choice and used widely in the uh, internet and this first in first out implies a single class of traffic which essentially means that we have a single queue. Uh, so, whoever comes in first he is the one uh, everything is going fine then he is the one who would be 
um, serviced uh, first. Okay. So, it is a first in first out. So, that has to do with the scheduling and uh, there is a drop tail that means arriving packets get dropped when Q is full regardless of which flow it belongs to or regardless of its importance. So, whoever I mean if the bu uh, buffer is full whoever comes next you just drop in that is a drop tail. So, FIFO has to do with the scheduling discipline and drop tail uh, that means uh, drop policy which has to do with the buffer management how you manage your buffer that means how much of your buffer you keep empty or whether you allow the buffer to get full whom do you drop when the buffer gets full etcetera these are the buffer management policy. So, we have a scheduling actually they are always uh, sort of go hand in hand that uh, this uh, scheduling policy and the uh, buffer management policy they always come in pair. FIFO issues in a FIFO discipline the service seen by a flow is convoluted with the arrivals of packets from all other flows. So, there is no isolation between flows and no policing send more packets get more service. So, just think about it we have one single um, um, queue. So, whoever is pumping in more uh, packets into it he is more likely to be um, um, serviced okay. of, of course, he will lose some packets also, but other people will also lose some packets, but it sort of favors in some sense it favors somebody who is pumping data at a um, at a higher uh, rate. So, he gets he gets more service all right may be he requires more service or uh, or maybe he is just uh, it is just some kind of a rogue node. So, you cannot say, but anyway you do not differentiate between different flows at all. So, there is no isolation between the flows. Okay. If there are if there is a flow which is very important, but sends less number of packets he will get serviced much less compared to the one who is pumping a lot of packets. So, that is a issue with FIFO and some drop tail issues like say router is forced to have large queues. Uh, to maintain high utilizations. Uh, uh, so, that is uh, that is a problem. So, larger buffers implies larger steady state queues or delays. Uh, so, the delay is more that is one thing. Secondly, synchronization n hosts react to same events because packets tend to be lost in burst. So, what would happen is that when the buffer gets full all the packets different packets coming from different sources would be dropped. So, all the um, sources would know that their may be their packets would time out or something. So, they would sort of act again in unison and this acting in unison is always bad. Okay. Then you tend to take and uh, then you take another step which again is again wrong in uh, some way. So, it become makes the thing more bursty and lockout a side effect of burstiness and synchronization is that few flows can monopolize the uh, queue uh, space. So, these are drop tail issues. So, priority queuing in priority queuing what we do has we have classes have different priorities and class and may depend on explicit marking or other header info for example, IP source or destination TCP port numbers etcetera. Transmit a packet from the highest priority class with a non empty queue and this have preemptive or non preemptive version. So, there this is the kind of scheduling policy which you might have. So, routers need to be able to classify arriving packets according to QoS requirements this is packet classification and transmit packets in order to meet the QoS. So, may you, maybe you have a class A service which is very premium. So, there is a lot of so lots of dollars there and class B service and class C service and you might attach different priorities to these different queues and serve them that way. <coughs> so, each router must implement some queuing discipline queuing allocates uh, bandwidth and buffer space. So, bandwidth which packets to serve next and buffer space which packet to drop next. Router maintains multiple, but is the one this thing which is uh, very widely used weighted fear queuing. Router maintains multiple queues for each output line one for each source. The queues are serviced in a round robin fashion. Instead of packets the volumes can also be examined. Some sources can be given a greater weight than others. The point is even if you do not give a, a greater weight and the point is the service which is premium that may be much less number of people over there. So, automatically since the round robin is between the queues automatically those uh, the those having a premium class since the population is low there they get better service. 
you may use a few bits and header to indicate which queue or a packet goes into. So, that is also this thing. Mm -hmm. Lower delay and low likelihood of packet drop for uh, maybe uh, high end users. Okay. So, priority round robin classification aggregation these are the uh, different mechanisms which we use. So, with this we come to a, a sort of a, the end of a short uh, <laughs> handling of this congestion control issue. It is not a very easy issue because as you know that this is a, a global problem, but you have to take some local action so that it uh, works fine. Um, in the next lecture, we will uh, take up uh, quality of uh, service. Quality of service as uh, we have already mentioned today that um, we have uh, different kinds of requirements, different kinds of quality requirements for different uh, uh, sets of uh, people. Uh, as I mentioned that if you are sending a file, uh, that means transferring a file, you do not want any bit to be lost and uh, it may be a very vital bit. So, that it may be a binary for a source or something that the whole thing may become junk if you lose one bit. Uh, so, it is very, but then if it goes in a jerky fashion, if it takes longer time maybe you do not mind. So, that is one kind of quality you require. Another kind of quality you might require is that say when you are doing some kind of multimedia transmission like audio, video etcetera, where I may uh, sort of be insensitive to a few packets being lost or a few bits being lost here and there, but if the delay keeps on varying of the delay is too large or keeps on varying too much, then I have a problem with the quality of uh, uh, reception. So, that is a different kind of quality. So, how to handle different kinds of qualities and how multimedia transmission etcetera can take place in the network that would be our next lecture. Thank you. Good day. So, our uh, topic for today is QoS and multimedia that is quality of service and uh, multimedia. So, we will just look at these one by one hmm. quality of service. Now, what is quality of service? QoS refers to traffic control mechanisms that seek to either differentiate performance based on application or network operator requirements or provide predictable or guaranteed performance to applications, sessions or traffic aggregates. Well, it uh, talks about a lot of things. The basic uh, uh, notion is this that there are some applications uh, which require one kind of quality of service. By the way, the quality of service uh, may mean so many different things, but the most important of them are the delay, network delay and the um, packet loss, all right, delay and various ways the delay.